first is from Fiona Ferder, Your Honor. Where to begin, there is a lot I could say about this situation. My name is Fiona Ferreter. I am Ronan Ferreter's older sister and the eldest daughter of Timothy and Tracy Ferreter. I wanted to share the impact of my brother's abuse on him, my sister Nola, and my other brother Pierce. Consider what it is like to have lived in a house where you can hear the screams of your younger brother when he is not in his room. Screams of frustration, hurt, anger, fear, helplessness, and despair where you can hear your father yell profanities at him, where I could hear my father beat him to the point where my brother was no longer screaming, but crying out in pain and barely able to answer questions. I thought it was over after I heard my dad slam the door shut and storm up the stairs, but no, it was just the continuation of a cycle I knew would start again. That happened too many times to count. It was the same thing, it became a routine. And I couldn't do a thing to stop it. All I could do was hope the storm blew over and that no one else would be targeted. Nola, Ronan, and I all played the game of hot potato with a bomb that could explode at any moment. Who was going to face Tim's angry tone next? Was he going to rage? Would he slam the door? Would he shout? Or was he going to stuff his anger down his throat and plaster a smile on his face and let us off with a warning? No one dared push him past his limit. We didn't want to be the next person locked in our room or restricted from leaving the house. I learned to calm, to clam up when those eyebrows drew together and those eyes darkened. We learned to ask for things at the right time when he was content. I tried yelling back once, it got me nowhere. He disregarded my attempts to get him to listen. All he could do, all he could see was disrespect. All he could hear was a rude daughter. The moment I discovered that he couldn't hear me, I snapped my jaw shut and matched his glare. I looked for any sign of an understanding father. He couldn't see or hear the daughter that just wanted her Baba to understand her, to listen to her for once. That's all she wanted that dark night when she looked up at her father's unyielding face. Instead, she went to bed with angry tears and left behind a stone statue of a parent. When we went out, we all put on the best family faces. We were the perfect Ferreter family, and we were the Ferreter kids perfect, polite children, each with our own strict roles. But if you looked closer, you would see the cracks that opened every time the door shut and we were in our own home. You'd see that the oldest child who watches her family silently, trying to keep it from fragmenting. You'd see a middle, a middle brother slowly starting start to stop smiling in pictures. Then there was the younger sister, who despite seeming like the golden child, barely opened up to her parents. And finally, there is the baby who fortunately is not quite old enough to, for, to fully understand the thin layer of glass his family walks on. We were all actors, pawns in the game of life my parents wanted us to play. My brother ran away several times. There, these are the two major instances that I can remember. The first night he returned seemingly shocked and slightly dazed. He never told me what happened. To be honest, I probably saw less of him after that. The second instance, he didn't come back. I remember my mother sending me down into the dark of Arizona to our driveway to call for him. She thought that he might be more likely to answer me than her. I wanted to ask her if she knew why. It's not right that a child should not come home when their mother, who should care for them, calls them. But of course my brother didn't. So I walked down that driveway and called for him. Even though I called for him, I whispered to myself, don't come back. It will be so much worse if you come back. By then, I was past the sensor that our driveway had and was looking out into the inky blackness of the night. For a moment, I considered how easy it would be to run after my brother. After all, my mother was on the porch and the sensor wouldn't be able to tell. I had the chance. But where would I go? And more importantly, who would take care of my other siblings? So I turned back and walked back inside the house. That night was scary. My younger sister came into my room and we had the most serious discussion maybe longest discussion we had ever had in a while. I could tell that we both did not feel safe in the house. So I offered to have her sleep in my room with me, something we hadn't done since elementary school. I placed a little bell on the door and told her if something were to happen, we would hear the bell and be ready. We talked about our parents. We wondered if they would ever divorce because we could hear them shouting at each other. Eventually, our brother came back. Things got worse. They started to keep him in the laundry room with no pants. One time they blocked up the door with boxes so he couldn't get out. 
he was kept on even more surveillance. At this point, he may as well have been a prisoner. My father found him with a cord for charging a phone. When he asked my brother why he had that, my brother told him that he was going to try and hang himself. My father mocked him, asked him, did you really think that could hold your weight? My father may as well have laughed in my brother's face. It reminded me of a different time my brother had mentioned suicide. We were at some hotel and my brother was sitting on the floor. We were arguing about something and he shouted at me that he wanted to kill himself. At the time, it was my mother who brushed it off. The, ex the effect was the same for both times. The only difference is that the broken defeat in my brother's voice instead of the angry shout as he emits his desire to die. There were other instances, other signs I should have noticed, but I didn't, and I could do nothing. I couldn't do a single thing to stop any of it. I couldn't stop my father from grabbing by my brother by the back of his neck. I couldn't stop my father from lifting my brother up the wall with only one hand on his neck. I tell the same story every time, and it's still on my mind. What if my father had killed my brother? What if he had died that day in front of me? What if he had suffocated or his neck had snapped? What if it happened and I didn't see? What if I woke up one day and my brother was no longer with me? They could say it was an accident, but that's not the point. My brother would have died because of my father's anger. All I wanted was my father's approval. That's all we wanted. We wanted to hear him congratulate us on a job well done. When we were younger, we heard the praise, but my brother slowly stopped hearing it. In exchange, he heard crass language coming from a man who was supposed to be his caretaker, his protector. I know my brother was hyper. He needed something to do. He needed more attention. He did not need to be told that he was going to end up in jail if he kept acting the way he did. He needed guidance of what's right and what's wrong. He did not need to be slapped like a bad dog. He deserved answers and more help. None of that was given to him. We moved to Florida the night after my winter formal. One night I was with one of my friends. The next morning I was in a car ride out to Florida. I still had my friend's rose and chocolate he had given me as a gift with me in the seat. I remember sitting in my room even after it had been put together. It felt like I was living in a stranger's house, like all this was all temporary, a poorly planned joke. It felt like we were on vacation and were going to go back any time, and secretly I wish we did. We did end up moving, at least my siblings and I did, but not in the way we imagined. My brother ran away again. He did not come back and everyone got tense. My father got even more angry. One night my sister and I were tasked with cleaning the kitchen. We cleaned and went to our rooms. Then suddenly we hear our father grumbling in a loud tone. He slammed open our doors and asked us why the counters were still dirty and bellowed at us some more, asking if, we had to, if he had to do everything himself. My sister started crying and we silently rewiped the tables. I retreated to our Florida room with my phone. My sister told me she was going on a bike ride. I numbly nodded and went to call my friend. I didn't know what to do. My father came out of his room once and I watched him grab a drink and then hide away back in his room. It didn't quite register with me that my sister had just gone for a bike ride in the middle of the pitch black night. I don't think I would have been surprised if she didn't come back. Running away was no longer an improbability. She did come back, and we wondered what the next thing would be. At some point, my parents left the house to go to a softball tournament, and my father left the country. I was home alone. I rode my bike from school and band sessions. I was told not to let my brother in the house. I was alone in a new house with just the dogs for company. As of right now, I cannot remember the in-between. The next few things I remember include leaving my room one night and seeing policemen talking to my mom. I remember being afraid of the way they peered around the corner at me. I didn't know what they were talking about. Then I remember someone coming in and taking pictures. We were pulled out of school. As a student who was not known for being a troublemaker, the day I was called to the front office was odd. Someone escorted me to the office. I heard the police announce over their walkie-talkies that I was on my way to the office. I was told over and over again that I wasn't in trouble. I was driven in a car to a meeting point. My sister was in another group of people. We were told to turn off our phones so they couldn't be tracked. We were driven to a place in a state of semi-confusion. Soon we were seating in a building waiting to be asked questions. I knew exactly why I was there. I knew exactly what they were going to ask about. I cried. I felt so guilty. I felt like I was betraying my parents. But a part of me knew all of this was a long time coming. Then we were shuffled to placement ready for me at first. But the foster parents, my sister and little brother, were going to be sent to luckily allowed me to come. My older, my other, I cried to God. 
Why, why me, why us, this isn't fair. Ronan was a child. I have seen what my parents have been saying and all of it is a bunch of empty excuses, a bunch of flimsy covers for atrocities they committed. Yes, Nola got sent to the hospital now and then. It's how we learn to toughen up. My brother would never hurt us intentionally. What was the dangerous level? To make matters worse, after Pierce was born, he was moved from his room in the house to a place in the garage. That room stank. He was rarely left alone and it was often dark. He was sent there for a variety of reasons. These range from major behavioral issues to the most minor issues, such as talking back, which was usually just trying to explain himself. Most of the time, it was these little issues. I sent my father into a rage and my mother followed in his footsteps. If he said anything, it would be talking back. And if he said nothing, it would be rude because he wasn't answering his questions. Again, I ask, what is a kid supposed to do in that situation? It's not fair. I couldn't do anything about it, and I should not have been worried about doing anything. I should not have had to worry and continue to worry for my brother's life. Nola have to be so angry about her parents. Ronan should not have to feel so guilty about the abuse inflicted on him. Pierre should not have to grow up without his siblings. My siblings and I should not have to see our last names in the news. We should not have to see our parents' mugshots. We deserve as regular, a regular of a life as we can get. I know I want that for them, at least. Thank you for taking the time to hear me. Fiona Ferreter. Thank you. You have another statement, Ms. Coach? Yes, Your Honor. This one is from Noah Ferreter. All of the past almost two years have been a whole, whole life turning experience. It has had huge ups and downs. Some of the time I felt like I just wanted it all to be over with and all gone. I did not usually express my emotions, but when I do, it all comes out. Every time that has happened, it has had something to do with my parents. They can say all they want that they love me and my siblings and care for us, but do they really? They say it, but they don't show it. Mm -hmm. If they really did, all of this would have been in the past, over, and they would do what's best for my siblings and my mental health, especially my brother Ronan. They have put him through so much, and I will never forgive them for treating him the way they did. After everything they did to him, all the abuse, neglect, they keep on saying it's all his fault. None of this has ever been at all his faults. Parents should be parents, which means parents should be loving and caring, and they were none of that. When I lived in that house, I used to think saying I love you was weird. We never said it to each other. My dad would always either be working or watching TV. We hardly had times where we would come out and hang with the family. I was also never allowed to hang out with my brother Ronan and my sister, and I never got the bond that sisters are supposed to have because our parents wouldn't let us be kids. When I was there in that house, I had to be perfect, no matter what. I had once been playing around with a friend in class, and the teacher had said something to my parents about it. Later, when I got home, I got yelled at and yelled at. There were no mistakes allowed. At first, I thought the way our household was run was normal. I had thought that my brother living separate from us was normal because they always said it was because of his actions. Now being older, Ronan did not do anything wrong. He was being a kid. He was not allowed to do anything, so he went back at them as a kid would usually do. If the parents say no, the kids want to do it more. Right before we moved to Florida is when I started realizing that the way that my mom and dad acting was not right. I had started to get afraid of him and would hide in my sister's room with her so I did not need to see him. I had always seen the way he treated Ronan. It was horrific. No child should be ever treated in such a way. I have seen my brother being held back by the back of his neck to walk to the bathroom, being screamed at the top of my dad's lugs. Ronan screams for my dad. I have heard the whip of the jump rope hit Ronan and the slaps of banging on the wall. Being in that house was scary. My brain has tried to let me forget a lot of what happened and has locked it away. They can say all they want that Ronan had put me in the hospital and been a danger to us, but all he was doing was playing around and being a kid and I also played around with him too. The way Tim talks about my brother is crazy. Saying all that, all of this is his fault is insane. How does a person not care at all about a child he himself raised from a baby? Nothing Tim did is justified. Tim and Tracy have put me and my siblings through so much bad mental health. At one point I was scared to go out of my house because I thought my parents were stalking me. I saw them once after school while I was walking to get picked up
court would look at Florida Statute 921.143, it looks like that victim impact statements are only for the victim, next of kin, law enforcement, correctional or correctional probation officer to make a statement at a sentencing or submission of a written statement. So I believe under that statute, the um, statements of Fiona and Nola should not be considered by the court. In response? They're next of kin. They're, her, they're his sisters. All right, objections over the you may continue. Um, in the morning with my brother, and then I never wanted to see them again. They have kept me away from my younger brother. I have not seen him in over a year, and they will not they will not let my uh, my speak. Oh wait, sorry. In the morning with, I was walking to get picked up, and I froze. I could feel I couldn't feel a thing, and my instinct was to walk away and not say anything. This is the first time that I have seen them since they got arrested the first time. The first time they got arrested, I had seen them that day in the morning with my brother Pierce. After that, I never wanted to see them again. They have kept me away from my younger brother. I have not seen him in over a year, and they will not let me speak to him on the phone. All of this has hurt me so bad when I feel like nothing can hurt anymore. Me, Fiona, and Ronan are all good kids and did not deserve any of this. Sincerely, Nola Ferreter. And then finally, I have um, a letter from James Roberts, who he doesn't want to read out loud, but I have provided it to the vents and provided it to the court. He understands it will be part of the public record. Okay. We have a copy, Ms. Moran. I do, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Moran. 